I am here to ask approval of the changes for the on-site helper job description. The changes are, we would like to add for number four under qualifications, must have completed the child care standards per the Florida Administrative Code, which is 40 hours of training. We have checked and required this when we do hire some, an on-site helper now but we just wanted to add that piece to the job description and then under performance responsibilities we added number 13 to annually complete the child care standards florida administrative code they have to complete 10 hours of training so we wanted to add those two to the um, job description i move to approve that we accept the changes on the on-site helper job description. Second. The motion by Mr. Kennedy is second by Ms. Powers. Do you have any questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries five zero. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Ms. Wright, pick her up. Okay, good morning. I am here to ask for your approval to move forward with the Health Insurance Committee recommendation concerning our health insurance administrative services only contract and I do have some information to share with you in that regard last time I was here I shared with you the projection for our year-end numbers we were very very close to what we had projected this slide does have a bit of an update from the one that um, you had received a couple of days ago and you'll see that our bottom line net that we ended our year with was the negative 590,000 458 slightly different than the 520 just a few little adjustments after our last meeting as we stated at the last meeting we had anticipated that we would um, end up in the negative and in that with that anticipation we had set aside a line item to be reserved for 1.6 million should we need need that money um, in recognizing that we would probably need money to help make the the budget balance this is the actual um, actuary statement as you know we take our information at the year end and our calendar year end for health insurance we take to an actuary who uh, looks at our numbers and prepares our report for the state as a self-insured health insurance plan we are required to submit an actuary report to the state for actuary soundness so after giving this to the information to our actuary he prepared this report for us and in the end it was needed to move 600,000 as you saw on the previous slide we were at the negative 590,000 so we did transfer 600,000 of that 1.6 million that we had set aside anticipating that there could be a need so after that transfer he did submit this report to the state for us on our behalf and we have received information back from the office of insurance regulation that our plan is actuarially sound um, which is a good thing there was a time earlier this year that we weren't quite sure how we would end up the year um, recognizing had we not been actuarially sound we could um, show that we were making steps toward that soundness but um, fortunately we have received this letter back they accepted our plan as being actuarially sound so again we have the 1.6 million that we did have on that reserve line we do recognize that we could still at a later date need some of those funds potentially um, but at this point in time, the 600,000 has been what we've needed to become actuarially sound. Good. So just to share some information with you that we shared with our health insurance committee for your consideration would be the fact that we have done a comparison, an ASO, administrative services only comparison to some surrounding counties and some counties of like size. We've had opportunity to get information from 17 other school districts and government agencies. Just so you'll, just to remind you, we are currently paying $40.14 per contract. 
per health insurance contract that we have, whether it be an employee only, whether it be a family plan, it is $40.14 per month per plan is what our ASO rate is. So we did survey these other 17 districts. And as we had thought, um, we are ha we have a very good rate with Florida Blue. Um, we're able to appreciate and, and have this rate that we have currently with Florida Blue. Of these 17 other districts, four of those districts were lower than ours. But as we looked at those four that were lower than ours, they are significantly larger than us. give you an example um, of those four others that are long, that have a lower rate because the larger the more contracts they have they're able to negotiate a lower ASO rate and of those four districts one of them is twice our size one of them is five times our size another would be three times our size and the fourth is four and a half times the size of our district and that would sort of explain why they're able to get that lower rate that they were able to negotiate one that we have checked on does show it being a lower rate, but um, we don't have, we're still waiting on some, a little bit of additional data on that. I'd like to also mention that I have with me today, as I did at the last meeting, Mr. Ram with Crown, who works very closely with us um, with our health insurance. We also reached out to Symmetra, and if I could remind you, that's who we have our reinsurance with. And Symmetra has opportunity to work with many counties, many um, agencies, and they deal with all different health care providers. So they are able to see claims that are coming in, claims that are being paid for all of the health care providers. And based on their data that they have, they have shared with us that um, we, could, we will anticipate some increases in the Symmetra world if we were to go to another provider other than Florida Blue. So that's something that we just need to consider. Part of what Symmetra, um, the data that they have and the reason they project that our claims will increase if we move from Florida Blue is the fact that the other health care providers don't have as good a no negotiated rate with our providers, with the medical facilities, with the doctors. Florida has a very good negotiated rate. And if we change providers, we can expect our claims to go up, which would be expenses for our employees as well, their portion of the claim. So we feel like Symmetra is an unbiased third party that we can look to to get this information from. They, they said that based on facts, based on the numbers that they work with regularly, they would expect our claims to increase by 6 to 9 percent. So if I could just back up, when we, we say ours is $40.14, let's hypothetically say that even if someone offered us $5 less, which would be a significant savings. When you calculate that out, we would save overall in a year $100,000 for $5 less, which I'm not sure we could get $5 less, but if we could, we'd save $100,000. But then Symmetra is telling us that we would ex expect our claims to increase by 6 to 9%. So if you look at what our claims were last year, even if we just take the middle of the road, 7.5%, we can expect our claims to go up by approximately a million dollars. So we might save 100000 on our ASO fee, but we need to also remember that Symmetra, who has this data, is telling us that our claims will go up, um, most likely by a million dollars. They're also telling us and that they are our reinsurance provider. So they are telling us if we go with someone other than Florida Blue, because their rates are, not, they are better than with the facilities than the other companies, if we go with someone else, they tell us that they will have to increase our Symmetra reinsurance premium because we will be a greater risk to them. Our claims are going to cost us more. We're a greater risk to them, so they're going to have to charge us a higher premium. And they're telling us that our premium will increase by 8 to 12 percent. So based on what last year's premium was, I'll take the middle of the road again, if our premium increases by 10 percent, our premium is going to go up by 60000 so again, these are things to consider. And if we're going to save on the ASO fee, we're looking at increased claim claims, and we're looking at increased Symmetra fee premium. Symmetra's, yes. Symmetra's going to go up uh, regardless of who we have, correct, next year? They have gone up, yes. We have negotiated. Uh, this, this 6 to 9%? That will be on top of 
of what we are currently going to be paying for 2017. They're going to, it will go up. It will go up another 8 to 12 percent if we go with another network because that premium was given to us based on Florida Blue. But it's going to go up 6 to 9 percent if we stay with Florida Blue. Is that, is that what we're saying? And an additional 10 percent if we go on. No, the 6 to 9 is what our claims would increase. Mm -hmm. The actual premium has gone up. Um, would the premium go up next year if we stay with Florida Blue? How much would that be? For 2017 or 2018? For, uh, for 2018. We don't have a quote yet from them. What about 2017? It's $40. It went up to the $40.14. But he's asking what percentage that was. I'm, I'm, I'm Reinsurance. I'm asking for the reinsurance. I understand. Right. And I do have that if you want to give me just a second. Don't know the percentage, but last year our reinsurance was six hundred thousand. And this year, and I explained at the last meeting why this was, it went to seven hundred thousand. So for 2018, we could expect an 8 to 12 percent increase on that 700,000, which would be 70, 70,000. But you see what I'm saying, though, Sherry? It, it says if not with Florida Blue, that that's what they're saying. If we stay with Florida Blue, right? We did stay with Florida Blue for 2017. So in 2016, we paid 600,000. We negotiated a rate, and because of those reasons we explained last time, an extremely high climate that we have. Um, we had a significant increase mainly because of that, and so we are at 700000 for year 2017. They're telling us that for 2018, if we change, and that is staying with Florida Blue, right. but for 2018, if we don't stay with Florida Blue, it will go up an additional 8 to 12 on top of this big hike we had because of this particular individual and because of the high claims. I would not anticipate if we stay with Florida Blue, I wouldn't anticipate that we're going to have that big of a jump like we did from 16 to 17. That big jump was because of that. I, unless we have another huge factor that we're not expecting, I wouldn't expect that much of an increase again. So, uh, but if, if I'm going off this, if I say if, that second statement, if with Florida Blue, okay, mm -hmm. uh, what this, our symmetric premium will increase probably nothing you're saying um i wouldn't say probably nothing okay there would be a slight so, increase yeah i would i would suspect here if we stay with florida blue versus if we not with mm -hmm. when it's symmetric i know we're using the symmetric data to increase i mean we're it, we have to look at that because that's the little bit of savings on premiums yeah. good morning um what they're saying is is we still have to go through our renewal process whether we have florida blue or whoever the aso carrier would be so, and right now it's too early to tell what the claims increase would be um, for 2018. But what they're saying is, is on top of whatever we have to budget for, um, for claims, they're saying if there is another uh, carrier there, we would have to add an additional uh, percentage to that for, for paying claims. That's what they're saying. Yeah. So, just for argument, let's just say that to get seven hundred dollars, seven hundred thousand in claims. Let's say that was a, that was a thousand units that 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 involved. <clears throat> You're saying if it wasn't Florida Blue, those same thousand claims might have cost us nine hundred thousand dollars instead of seven hundred thousand. Well, what they're saying, is or that's what they're they're that they're they're, they're su suggesting is. that that could be the case right. because so, of the rates that they're getting with their providers. Right, so and then there would be a difference between that two hundred thousand dollars, let's say, theoretic difference, on the reinsurance. So what they're saying is, right now your claims were on a gross claims basis for two thousand sixteen was twelve point seven million. They're saying if we take those claims and put them with another uh, another ASO carrier, we'd look anywhere, we would have to add anywhere from six to nine percent to pay those same claims. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have to take an account for trend and so forth as we move to 2018, as we move forward. But we would have to add an additional uh, budget dollars to account because of the discounts that 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 are not there with the other. Because they're saying even if you had, if you mirrored 
every claim to be the same with another provider they're suggesting it'd be a six to nine percent increase i know you use additional models but i'm saying just from that perspective if you mirrored the claims right they're saying six to nine percent more we'd be paying with another carrier and then because of that that would be that much more reinsurance that we would then have to pay and that's what they're suggesting not only are you having the six to nine percent but you're also having the the right. There's increase. an additional exposure on the, the large claim that which is the specific premium, which is the seven hundred thousand that Sherry was speaking about. Yeah, there would be an additional cost for that. But the big dollar is over on the sixty nine per six and nine percent, because that's where our where our claims are. That's where the twelve million dollars is not the premium we pay is a very small portion. It's the claims that we have to budget for, that's where the that's where the real meat is. I just want to, I think you've just clarified it for me, but I, I had the same problem with the, the line that we're discussing, saying our claims would be higher. I was looking at the number of claims, but you're looking at the amount paid for each claim. You're not saying that you would have more claims because we didn't have to Right. It's the dollar. It would be the same amount of claims. It would be the amount paid by the insurance. That's correct. Okay. Because I thought, why would we have more claims just because we can't? <laughs> yes. No, thank you for that clarification. You're exactly right. Okay. And then just to share with you the health insurance committee and i appreciate the fact that mrs brian is on our health insurance committee and we have broad representation we have representation from all school sites and all the school <coughs> departments um, there's instructional there's support they're administrative their recommendation by an overwhelming majority was that the district meet with florida blue and discuss renewal with florida blue rather than go out for the rfp and their feeling is also that if Florida Blue is able to offer us a rate that is still well below what the average is based on that survey that we have done, that we would stay with Florida Blue, in their opinion. Some of the reasons that they were citing, um, they're pleased with the service that we received from Florida Blue. Um, they prefer, if at all possible, not to have to change health care providers and go to another network. And they don't want, one thing that was discussed among several, where they don't want any interruption in network providers, the in-network providers that we have with Florida Blue. Um, they don't want to have to change providers because they may not be in network with other companies. So again, that's the recommendation of the committee, and that is what I'm asking approval for, is to follow that recommendation and to meet with Florida Blue and um, see if they're able to continue with. We have a, a good thought, a good, um, probability that they're going to offer us something really good, you know, a good plan that we would be able to continue with them. I think they want to keep our business if at all possible. So I think it's worth um, having that meeting with them and seeing what, what they have to offer for us. And again, that's the committee recommendation. So did anyone have any questions about anything presented? I'm wondering, I think, that I think they would be prepared to meet with us a quick turnaround. Just for I would say, I mean, within a week or two. We just got to get on the calendar. So. Just for clarification, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but just so that the public also, all of this has nothing to do with the wellness center, the services at the wellness center, the service level at the wellness center. This has to do with just the operational management and control of, of the individual policies through Blue Cross Blue Shield. Correct. And so you and basically what we're saying is that you want to go back to Florida Blue and say, hey, we want to renegotiate this contract. What can you do for us? What can you do for us? And we're not making a commitment um, to them right now. We're just making a commitment to negotiate, correct, rather than bid. Correct. It's not renegotiating. The contract is actually entered into contract negotiations for additional Right. There's no commitment at this point to so we would have to come back for your approval. Right. In your <clears throat> and when does it expire by? In the calendar year. And now those negotiations will deal with the entire picture, the wellness dollars, the, the contract period. You know, I, I think it's wise not to get into a four-year contract or to have three-year contract or have a two-year plus renewal and I know Mr. Blocker and Jerry I'm sorry we talked a little bit about that I mean to me that means a lot there's going to be changes in health care in the next few years and 
I would prefer not to enter into a four-year contract. Um, and so, you know, I think that that, in my view, is part of this. I mean, what you negotiate protects us. If there's an out clause, what we need to have there protects the bottom line. Because um, health insurance cost, I mean, this is a lot It's of a moving target, right? Yeah, now. It's a moving it target. It is a bargain. Yeah, it, and a lot of money. I mean, we we dealt with this through the Affordable Care Act right now, and it's been <coughs> challenging enough. But, and Mr. Bradshaw, maybe it's it's more of a legal question, but if we if we enter into a contract and for some reason they let's just say that if, if whatever comes out of it, as Mr. Dodd saying, and I, and I think it's a valid point, uh, it puts us into some new exposure of some sort, um, or or reduces our exposure. So therefore, we've been paying for a cost that maybe we wouldn't have to pay for. I think that's the other side of it. Um, I would think that the, the federal government, I mean, the law, the federal law is going to circumcise, I mean, it's going to be uh, over any contract with regards to health care. I mean, it would cover all. approach that we certainly will make sure that and, and like currently now the the contract we have is it's annually you know we can get out of it at any time during the year and we have those out clauses now um, it is a four-year deal but we can you know have if we have out clauses that we can exit the, the contract uh, we may lose you know if we were paid up front it's typical of, of wellness dollars so we have to structure in such a way that we don't want to put ourselves in jeopardy of losing those dollars the next time around so yeah we wouldn't want to have to pay money to get out of it correct Correct. So we would have to make sure we negotiated all those terms and conditions and actually have an out clause or, or a different modifier to say that if something changes in the federal government with the affordable health care, that you know, this will modify as well. So, And then the pharmaceutical um, um, contract. I think we would still be prepared to go out for an RP on the pharmaceuticals and go out look at a different pharmacy uh, benefit manager. Uh, right now we've, we've got it locked in with Florida Blue and their pharmacy benefit manager. But I think it may be prudent to still go out for the pharmacy uh, aspect of it and, just, and let Florida Blue bid on it as well as other uh, PBMs out there. And there's no indication from Florida Blue that they have an issue with that? No. They're not gonna... We haven't heard of any issues, with it, but once we start talking to them, we'll hear what they have to say. After tonight, there could be a whole lot of conversations. Yeah. <laughs> I think this just gives us the, the, uh, the opportunity to speak to them and, and see what they have to offer and feel like we can come to some type of resolution that's, that's beneficial to the health insurance fund and the school district and the employees. We would come back and present it to you. We think employer plans are going to all be in a similar boat, though, the way it sounds like some of the various conversations are shaping up. Right? Um, there seems to be whether there's going to be a shift away from depending on employer plans or not. Typically, the way those things are written, they all follow the federal guidelines. And right. federal guidelines change, they kind of in concert change with it. All right. Can I have a motion? Oh, I would move to if we would approve the committee recommendation for the meeting with the district and Florida Blue to discuss the renewal of the contract uh, prior to issuing the RFP. Second. We have a motion by the council. Do you have any other questions? Please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
So moved. Good work, Mr. Bradshaw. choose not to go, then my backup, Mrs. Powers, could go. So, <laughs> so I will keep you posted on that, but I would like us to, uh, hopefully there, we will have a meeting to meet uh, that morning, but I know we have another meeting coming up, or we're probably going to meet in the morning of the school board meeting day, and that's perfectly fine, but I just keep that in mind. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty. So I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to close the special meeting and I'm going to open the workshop. And we're going to begin with <coughs> the Academy of Environmental Sciences. Mr. Rollins. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Get the PowerPoint opened up. I sent you guys a copy yesterday afternoon. I uh, made just just one or two minor changes to that. We have formed a committee involving all of our high schools and also including AES lead teacher in uh, January to discuss uh, the AES student progression plan. Uh, very positive meeting, uh, very open meeting where everybody got to share uh, concerns, thoughts, and related to the AES student progression plan. Uh, and today what I'm going to present is you know, all of those recommendations that, that we had that came from that meeting. And again, I want to stress that it was a collaborative meeting. Uh, not one person dictated the meeting, but everybody's input was heard. And uh, since that time, I've had a Ms. Leeper, the uh, director, board director of AES, reached out to me and uh, wanted to talk about some concerns that she had. And um, I've included those later on in the presentation as well to make sure again to, to stress that this is a collaborative process that we're working through. Uh, as we met on the 26th of January, we wanted to make sure that we were all aware and educated on the original charter and what was included in that original charter because as a district we have an obligation as we enter, enter into a charter that we you know, support and make sure that we are implementing that charter um, as effectively as we can. Also, we reviewed some former contracts. We looked at the original contract and also the 2007 contract, which is up for renewal this summer. <clears throat> so if you don't mind, I'm going to highlight some of those things that we reviewed in that meeting before we came to any recommendations. And uh, uh, the AES mission, and I've highlighted a few words uh, throughout uh, to draw attention to the, the overall mission, uh, environmental stewardship and opportunities in, in natural sciences is the mission of AES. And if you look at the core philosophy per the charter, it also stresses that uh, getting students ready for entry level positions and or post secondary education and careers related to environmental science ensure relevance preparation for environmental science careers and also it stresses working with environmental organizations. 
So again, that's very apparent that schools set up to serve the environmental science population or students that are interested in that area. The original charter in reference to who would attend I found this very interesting. Again, this was the original charter and has changed in contract since then. Uh, it was a half a year beginning 10th grade, uh, continuing through the 12th grade. And the courses that a student would take at AES were uh, science, language arts, and research classes, and most of the time those research classes were related to science. And then at the base school, they would take their math, social studies, and other acquired electives. And their original target number was 60 to uh, 76 students. And then if you jump to the 2007 contract in reference to who would attend, it was a maximum of 80 students but if the facility expanded or improved, they might increase their population. And I, th and I think at one point they screened in a room would allow them to, which allowed them to have a few more students at their, at their campus. Um, and, and in this contract, students will ideally attend one half of each school year in grades 9 through 12. Other key components, and again, it's a little bit redundant, but I, I'm trying to stress the, you know, the mission and the focus of AES, but um, in the appendix of the contract, um, facilitate learning about the environment with a focus on careers in environmental science. It talks about appropriate stewardship of the environmental and natural sciences, preparation for environmental science careers, and again, it, it talks about taking classes in science, language arts, and research on those campuses. And uh, again, focus academic curriculum in the field of science and language arts. Other key components, and, and again, these are somewhat redundant, so I'm, I won't repeat myself, but there was an Appendix A, and I believe this was only included the, in the original contract. I did not see it attached to the 2007 contract, so I had some question of whether that Appendix uh, was intended to be with the 2007 contract. I don't think it, I do not think it was. Uh, but at one time, there was a set curriculum uh, that was in the contract that students would take this set curriculum, and it reflects the science, the language arts, and the research related to science. And, and I bring these out because somewhere along the way, we've expanded those classes and expanded the students. And um, when we met that day, the sentiment of the committee, and we have some of the committee members here today, we got some of our guidance counselors and school principals and our district personnel that, that all attended that. We felt like it was important uh, to sort of get back to some kind of process of what students take here at AES and what students take at their base school. Um, uh, there were, again, it was a very positive collaborative meeting. We sense the frustration a little bit from our counselors that you know, it just makes it difficult without a plan because you know they get students back and there's no telling exactly what they would have taken and now trying to piece together a schedule so you know when you're scheduling mass students as many of you know you, you really have to have a plan in place or at least an outline or a framework of a plan because if you don't then then we, we lose the focus and, and what's doing that you know doing what's right or best for, for students you know, our current student progression plan, which we uh, adjusted a little bit within the past few months uh, at a board meeting, you know, we have that listed there, but in a nutshell, uh, ninth grade students can attend a full year, 10th uh, and 11th grade students a semester, and then the 12th grade students with uh, meeting graduate or on track for graduation requirements and approval signatures, they could go a full year in the 12th grade year. Could you go back to that for a second? Sure. So this was the student progression plan that was approved last year? Or this is the current student? No, if, if you're... Which, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's suspended. It's suspended. It's suspended. It's suspended, right. Okay. Right. This includes those adjustments that you, you suggested in January. Right. So now we're going to get into the... And, and um, Mr. Rowland, just, I apologize, but just... And at that point, the biggest difference we did was we increased it to include all of the, potentially all of the senior year. Correct. Where previously it only included the one semester for the they senior year. Right, because if you think about that 2007 contract, it said students will attend a half a year from ninth grade to 12th grade, and you increased it from a uh, half a year for seniors to a full year potentially for seniors. Or from five semesters out of eight to six semesters yeah. out of eight. Correct. So I'm going to share um, 
the recommendations that day, we had a lot of discussion. Um, and the, at that time, the AES lead teacher recommendations, her recommendations at that time were that uh, ninth grade students attend a full year and 10th grade st students attend a full year. There's a little indifference from her about 11th grade, but she suggested that 12th grade students should attend their base school and should not attend necessarily at AES for their senior year. Um, so as we talked about our base school, said so that's not gonna work for us. Uh, ninth and 10th grade students, full year out there, us not having any contact with them, arriving in 11th grade, that's not a recipe for success for that student never have attended their base school. So we talked a little bit more. We, we did not come to a consensus between the, the lead teacher and our uh, representatives. Uh, but these are our recommendations from the school committee. And as we went through these, the, the lead teacher at that time did say, this looks like this could potentially work for us. So she never did fully endorse it, but she did have some positive commentary about it. And I'm gonna give you two, two options, but, and they're both very similar with only one slight difference that we talked about. Uh, students would attend the second semester of their ninth grade year at AES, and they, they would attend the first semester of the 10th grade at AES. And then during the 11th and 12th grade years, they would attend their base school. And, um, and we talked about numbers that day, and we did not hash out numbers specifically, but we talked about if you had 75 to 100 ninth grade students, they would rotate up to 10th grade, and that would keep your population anywhere from 75 to 100 students at all times at AES. And, and at that meeting, Ms. Balfour uh, wanted to have around 100 students, so we, we felt like uh, that would meet those goals. We did have an asterisk because we realized that during a transition year, uh, you, you need to have some um, flexibility because you can't just implement something and, and expect the numbers to work exactly. So what we discussed was that during the 17-18 transition year and only the 17-18 transition year, 11th grade students could attend the first or second semester at AES and then 12th grade students could attend both semesters if uh, they were in good standing. So uh, that would allow the flexibility in case they did not have enough ninth graders moving to 10th grade at this time, uh, would give them a, a, you know, hopefully enough students to uh, be around that 100 student mark that they were looking for. Mr. Rome, can I interrupt you on option sure. one? And maybe an option two that you just flashed. But the language that we discussed earlier about the 12th grade students when we were amending that in the language that we were talking about said that they had to be on track to graduate and right. that language is missing here. In this, this slide? Isn't, this isn't proposed as language. Okay. These, these other this concept. Okay. This is but, but, uh, and, I, and I would agree. I thought Ms. Count, that's an excellent point. I think if that's, I think, the type of thing we're looking at is to make sure that we're, we have those like on track to graduate. Right. That, it, you know, with this, and I know we're not we're not even close to that, but I, I think we ought to at least stay mindful. Yeah. And, and with this transition option, yeah, I think the, the language that, that we was created in January would, would probably apply to something like this. Option two, the difference in the uh, first option and this option is uh, students uh, would attend their 11th grade year at uh, AES the first semester. And uh, at our principal meeting, we had further discussion and we, we even clarified that maybe that option a little bit further that for that 11th grade year, students could attend first or second semester of the 11th grade year. So option two basically includes ninth grade students, second semester, 10th grade students, the first semester, and then 11th grade year, uh, they could attend first or second semester. And that's uh, option two. Any questions about those two options that, that, that have been presented thus far? And option two says no 12th grade. Correct. Okay. And, and again, at, at that meeting on that day, um, because of the discussion that was had from AES and from our, our, our representatives on that committee, did not feel like it was best for 12th grade students to attend at AES, and that was a consensus from everyone there that it was good for them to be back at their base school get in preparation for post-secondary careers or college and it was best that the student uh, the schools with the counselors and all their resources could best help a student prepare for uh, post-secondary 
And uh, that day we did break it down even further into suggested courses uh, or a framework for courses. And uh, in the ninth grade, the student at their base school uh, you know, had their math, social studies, health, personal fitness, uh, and elective. And second semester, they at AES, they would take a science, uh, environmental science, physical science, or biology, you know, that could be determined. And then ELA, and then the two elective courses, uh, which uh, could be science-related electives. And we, at that time, there was a concern uh, expressed from, from the AES representative that uh, well, if they don't come to our school the first semester, they, you know, they may lose interest and not want to come to us the second semester. So uh, I believe one of our counselors suggested, why don't we provide some type of field trips, you know, two or three field trips the first semester so that students could go out and visit AES and sort of keep that interest up and uh, you know, keep them motivated so that they would want to attend the second semester as a, as a ninth grader. 10th grade students, they would go to AES the first semester, again, a very similar track where you take the science, one of the required science, sciences, an elective course related to literature, you know, contemporary lit, creative writing, or something along those lines, uh, and then two electives, uh, you know, or research courses that would be science related. And then semester two at their base school, math, social studies, ELA 2 and an elective. And there was some discussion of whether English Language Arts 2 should be offered at AES or uh, at the base school and the, it was determined since the, the state testing, the FSA is the second semester, it may be best if they took that course at their base school during the second semester. Most of the preparation for that testing is done in the first semester. You still got, because of the block scheduling, you know, you, you, you've got children that are preparing in the first. Um, well, I see what you're saying. So never mind, because they're going to have an elective course at AES, and then they'll come to us the second year. Right. Okay. My mistake. And then if, uh, with the 11th grade option, which was our option too, if that's included, then uh, again, um, and you could, you could, we possibly flip these back and forth, but semester one at AES, science, ELA, and then again the two uh, electives related to science at AES, and then at the base school they would continue their math, social studies, and other electives. Any questions, uh, commentary that you'd like to make about those uh, sequence of courses? The only thing with um, on the, stuff, the tenth grade, it, it looks like. In essence, though, then you're doubling up on ELA. Am I am I seeing that correct? I mean, or Ms. Counts, you, I know that's kind of your area. But that's their testing year, and, and, and that's okay. I mean, you think that's a we kind try, of a, we try to do that as much as possible. No, that's that's we why I say teachers and things like that. But we try to make sure that they um, are working on their testing stuff. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the tenth grade or the eleventh grade. Okay. If you offer the ELA at um, at the AES. Then are you going to offer the AP level? The AP level, ELA, at, ELA at, at AES? Yeah. Um, we, we didn't really, we didn't hash that out. Um, I, I would think when you get into any uh, elective courses, not saying ELA, but any type of elective courses, if you wanted to include some AP courses, that, that could be an option as well. Yeah, the AP schedule is, is kind of determined by the advanced placement curriculum and, and the ELA uh, line is only offered in the junior year and then it's EA, ELA lit in the senior year. It's right, and we know there's tests. And students mm -hmm. that may or may not decide um, based on, on that if you don't offer it up there. I, I don't think it would prohibit them from taking it. If we still have kids want to take it, whether the teacher's comfortable teaching it, whether they want to offer it, they can offer it to the online Many times our, at our high schools right now, at least the current philosophy is that if the student has taken an AP course, regardless of what subject it is, they usually take a course prior to it that's not an AP course that's related. You know, for example, they may take an honors biology course and then go into an AP biology course all within the same year. And 
if you look at this 11th grade schedule where you take ELA, say English 3 at AES, and then when they come back as one of their electives, they may choose AP uh, language arts at their base school, which would be a nice flow. I don't think uh, we've done it though with ELA. <coughs> no. I, th I know we, we do it with, you know, U.S. history, and we do it with, you know, chemistry and biology now, and, right. but I, I don't think, I think ELA is probably one of the things. Right? Yeah, they do a yeah, uh, and then first semester, and then they do an English uh, AP in the second semester. It's honors in the fall, yes. and then Correct. Yeah. It's honors in the fall, and then usually advanced placement in the spring with the same teacher. It's married. So both groups, um, I, I don't see any like um, world geography, American history, or history of geography. I mean, I think they are. That's being taught out there now, right? Is that something that we're saying that would be no longer taught at AES? Uh, that, that was a recommendation of the committee because going back to the focus of the original charter at the school being environmental science and where it spelled out clearly that it would be science, language arts, and research related to science, we did not find social studies in that original charter. So we felt like, again, it was important to get back to what the charter was focusing on. And then the same way with the math. I mean, there's no math here, so we're saying that math will be taught in a school. Correct. No, no more math um, offered at AES. Correct. Math has been one of the most challenging things, I think, at the high school level for guidance counselors and, and teachers anyway, and I'm already seeing a little bit of, hand, of head shaking because we have so many percentage of kids, and it's Mr. Rowland's fault, he's his partner, of, um, that are graduating middle school with at least algebra one but many of them with geometry so now you've got almost three sets of kids going in three different directions when it comes to math their freshman year and and i know that's a challenge that the high schools have been dealing with particularly lower order and how do we deal with those higher order you know math um, options and um, so i know that i can understand with math my question too about the ap um, uh, AP English in 11th grade is you also then get into dual enrollment question at that point because that's usually one of those courses that becomes one of those dual enrollment questions. Now I think do we, is that one that we typically offer on campus at the or is that one of the one okay. at Crystal River. It's kind of a and so that's why I, I, I know that's where some people start getting their feet wet with you know, with some of that. Um, dual enrollment, I would think for them, for APS to offer dual enrollment on their campus would be difficult because they have a teacher. Right. And, and that's why I, I think we, I, I don't know if that's why, but that's one of the reasons why you wouldn't include APELA at uh, AES yeah. because they would have some options at their base school either to do dual enrollment or to take that AP course at, at their base school. Because there's, you know, that's too. And I'm, and I'm not disagreeing with the recommendation, but I would say typically it seems like in social studies in your 11th grade year, you're either taking social studies honors or you're taking social studies. And then the next semester you would take, if you're taking honors, a lot of times you're taking the AP side of that. It would seem that you would almost be able to more easily mirror up a social studies curriculum in that area at AES, then you might even DLA in that year. That's not, now the problem is, is it's trying to find that a perfect teacher that has the right qualifications to be able to teach becomes more challenging. But, I mean, if you were looking for one that was, <laughs> but if you're looking for something that, that, that really correlates back to the base school, that, that's certainly a consideration. But I think from, from what Mr. Rowland is saying, is I think the, the course selections are trying to stay with the vision and the mirror of the, the focus of the environmental Correct. academy, natural sciences and environmental sciences, and history doesn't match that at all. It, it doesn't, but at the time, I think, when they did that, we didn't have the course situation that we do today. Back then, we had straight ELA. When the, in, you know, where now we've gotten more into the choices of the AP, the dual enrollment options, for those students, I think that's becoming more of a continual focus, particularly I think with some, with some of the AES students that 
have wanted those options, and I think that's where in the past AES was trying to offer those to accommodate those students. And I'm saying, you know, that's that may not change in that regard. It's, it's going to be impossible to have at one size fits everything. I agree. And kids have to make choices. Mm -hmm. Sometimes band four is only offered at the same time as PE. Right. So you, they've got to make choices. They can't. Uh, every everything's not going to work out perfectly for every student. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> trying to have a plan that makes sense. <laughs> and uh, social studies was not part of the original plan. Okay. And that's the one that we, the school really felt like we needed to stay in school. And, you know, I, I don't run the AES budget, but I would think it's difficult for them to try to offer a buffet of courses with the few uh, teachers that they're able to pay for. It's going to be difficult for them to be able to meet their payroll with, a, with 80 to 100 students if they're offering all of those courses. But I think in the long term, if they focus on the courses that we agree to, it's going to be financially better for them as well. And I think most of our other academies and programs, you know from your freshman year through your senior year what courses you're going to take for that track. Now, some of the, the electives change and modify, but I, I know in biomedical, really you have this, you know, biomedical one, two, three, four. And that's what they're trying to do here. It's the same thing we're doing at every other, with every other track with students is let's set out a four-year plan as opposed to just developing a plan at the end of the nine years. And that was one of the discussions that came up at the committee is someone brought up, well, what are all of our academies doing? And it's like, yes, it's very scripted. If you take this first year, the second year, third year, and uh, it, it functions efficiently when it's scheduled like that. And, and just kind of off subject, though, but with our other academies, is IB the only one that's really where all the students tend to go within a cycle? I mean, I know like my son's in the health academy, and it, there's English, I think, the first year that's a health academy English, but after that, well, two, no, I'm saying the first year. That's the, the only two courses that they take is biomedical or your, son, your academy science and your English. And oh, and, and Spanish <coughs> has been offered. First two years of For the first two years. But other, after that, it's it's really just one semester you're taking an elective with that, and then the rest of it you're a general ed student within the program. Two sciences. Two sciences. Two sciences. We've expanded it. We've expanded it to be more of an academy, including more courses. Right. So what you're saying is correct. A couple of years ago, and each year we're we're making it more of an academy. Okay, I'll move to the next slide, and this really wasn't a discussion that day, but it's something that just came up recently uh, with micro school, and I don't want to get on a tangent, but uh, micro school, <laughs> micro school went through a, a, an audit, a budget audit, and and just in a short synopsis of that meeting, uh, we met with the gentleman from the state who was in charge of the budget portion of charter schools, and he's part of the bigger picture of charter schools, and and we, we learned a lot that we we have. Although we don't have authority, say, so to speak, over micro school, we have a lot of responsibility. And he was filling us in more about our responsibilities in working with charter. One thing that we do with micro school that was lifted out that's a very positive part of the process is throughout all of our departments in the district, we have a mid year meeting with micro school or we have a mid year evaluation form. I don't know if evaluation form is the best term, but a sort of an oversight form where each of these departments that you see listed on this slide, somebody in our district is responsible for reviewing micro schools processes related to those. And uh, when we sit down and it's a very collaborative meeting with, uh, with the micro school, mid-year, end of year. These are our you know, people that are overseeing these departments. This is, you know, it's working well here. Maybe it's not working so well here. Let's talk about how we can improve that process. And, and again, this wouldn't be in the student progression plan, but we would like to, to do something similar with uh, AES next year and the following year so that we can work collaboratively together and, and be um, a good resource and make sure information is being open and shared uh, effectively. So I just shared that slide with you. It's just something uh, that I think we can improve processes with AES with something like this. Um, also, at our current high schools, our base schools, um, we have a course approval process. So anytime one of our schools wants to add a new course, whether it's to an academy 
or to their campus. It goes through Mr. Chamblin's office and then comes to me and uh, Ms. Stanley to make sure it's appropriate and fits with the overall plan. And then once we approve it, then it gets implemented at the school. And, and I think we would like to see something similar at AES uh, you know, again, not to tell them what they can and can't offer, but we want to make sure it fits in with the overall plan for students graduating from high school. Last slide, and then we'll you know, get any questions you have. Uh, again, from my meeting with Ms. Uh, Leeper, we've had very good conversations. Uh, uh, you know, we both expressed that, that we feel that AES is a very valuable option for our students. We want to see it succeed. And our goal together is, you know, putting a plan together that, that can make AES be successful. Um, some of the concerns expressed, right now they have 27 students signed up for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And uh, that was never a consideration when we had our meeting because that, you know, hasn't happened before. So that was uh, very concerning on her part and our part. Uh, and of those 27, nine are seniors. Um, we have, uh, she has 120 students that have applied from the 8th grade to attend as ninth graders and we know not all those students always attend, you know, they apply to multiple places, see where they can get in, and, uh, but that is a very uh, high number, very healthy number uh, for applicants and I think some of it's attributed to that parent night that we had for all the academies. Well, thank you for doing yeah. that because I think IB Health Academy all of them said they had some of the record numbers yeah. of applicants because of that night. So that's really a testament to getting students and families to know about what offerings there are. Yeah, that was so a thank that you. Was great evening. Um, and it's Citrus High's um, Cody Academy as well. So under the, the plans that, that we've recommended today, um, even with our transition plan, they're still concerned that they may not have enough students to, to uh, open the doors, so to speak, next year, because if you only have 27 students that are returning, and although you have a high number of ninth graders in our current schedule, uh, they're there's, uh, supposed to start the second semester. So that does not, they, they want to be around 100 students most of the time out there what so about, again 27 students of 10th 11th and 12th grade students at AES only That's 20 all we have now they could possibly go out and do another recruiting we could try to uh, get some more kids that and are in and target some more kids I think I think it's a and I would suggest that we do this if, if you agree with this plan that we we do this and go back out and retarget students and show them that, that it's back to a, a focus on environmental science as opposed to just going out there to take courses. And I would also recommend that you consider a transition year uh, in this first year so we, we aren't as stringent about when the, the ninth graders go this first year just so they can build up their base population of ninth graders again. Because they'll lose a few, just like we all lose a few, from year to year. So this first year, if they start off with a larger number then I think they'd be better off down the road because we and we, just, we want to work with AES to do what's best for the kids out there we don't want to lose that as a resource but we do feel that the greatest resource AES is is that it's an environmental <coughs> science academy not that it's just a small school on the river uh, it is an environmental science academy and that's where we think the focus should be back at yeah. is environmental science and, and really that is a somewhat is, you know in both of the recommendations and I'm not saying the board is you know going in any one direction but it looks like you almost have to double up anyway for either these recommendations to get the numbers where you would need them to be I think so in some ways maybe the benefit is that this year has that uber number of and I think you know, we just you know we yeah. have some flexibility in the first year of the transition well bigly is a as a new term that's being used and that was interesting that day that there, there, you know, there was a few examples shared that there were students who initially had interest in going to AES because it was an environmental science school but once they realized that that what didn't have that strong focus some students chose well I, I'm going to not go to school there because it's not an environmental science focus overall so we found that that was a pretty interesting conversation um, so again we as Mr. Mullen stated I think if you know in uh, light of the numbers if we allowed a little bit of flexibility in this transition year to to get through this transition year 
uh, would, would be excellent for the next school year and part of that would be allowing ninth grade students to possibly attend the first or second semester uh, if that's what it takes to make it work. First or second semester but not both? Not both. You have to go back to the school at one time during the ninth grade. Correct. And I know that's not, not ideal, that's not what the committee wanted that day, but, but in light of the circumstances that, that have been shared recently, and you know, that's a concern that, that we have to, to deal with. So the, we're looking at changing that progression plan then to go back to uh, not allowing freshmen to go full year, only one semester of freshman year. Right, option one or option two is ninth graders ultimately will attend second semester of their first year at high school. And 10th graders will attend the first semester and then and then if you want to entertain option two for 11th grade students they could you know attend either semester of their 11th grade year if you remember january one of the biggest complaints you heard from the students is i don't know that school i've never been there mm -hmm. so we think it's important they get there their freshman year where you're going to be faced with that same dilemma they don't, they're not going to want to go back to a school that they've never been to I might suggest, just like we were, we were saying, that we could maybe boost the um, the tenth grade population by taking a field trip or something like that out there. Um, I think it is the, the first term of their ninth grade year. <coughs> I think is important, and I think there ought to be some kind of a field trip back, required field trip back to their guidance counselor, maybe uh, a to join in with pep rallies uh, and allow the kids to come back to school early for pep rallies at the base school or, or football games or um, homecoming so that they they are even if they're there for this transition year they still come back to their base school for certain <coughs> events to make sure that they're they don't really yeah that's a good idea because it was clearly expressed by all the schools that ninth grade year that first semester is all the processes and procedures for that school are typically covered very heavily in the uh, first semester of the freshman year. So that's really what sets a student up for success at their base school is those, uh, those orientations and processes and procedures and expectations. If we, if we allow them to come the first term this time in the transition year mm -hmm. and work with us a little bit to get those kids really on track at the base school also. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And then explain the senior year now with option two. The option two is one semester of senior year? Senior year, the, the students would not go to AS their senior year. During this transition year uh, would allow that flexibility for seniors to go to school there. But after the 17-18 school year, seniors would not attend AS. So the, the nine juniors that have signed up to return next year, the nine seniors for next year, will be able to go there the entire year if they're on, on track to graduate? Co correct. And then the following year, after the transition year, there will be no seniors at AES. Correct. And again, that was that students would attend their senior year at their base school because that's when students are uh, you having a lot of meetings with guidance counselors, preparing whether you know they're going to go to college, whether they're preparing for uh, trade school, military, or whatnot. And most of those resources are based at their base school and we felt like that would be the setting up students for the most success if we did that in their senior year. So I guess I'm, I'm just a little confused. Is recommendation, or is option one and, I know option two shows not having the senior year. So is option one the senior year mm -hmm. only for the transition year? Correct. Okay, so both options being recommended do not include a senior year. Correct. And that's where, if you know, I went back to that slide, if you'll see where students will go to the base school during 11th and 12th grade year with the asterisk at the bottom yeah. where it says transition uh, students could attend um, uh, 11th grade year at AES and then 12th grade could attend most semesters. So after the transition year, what's the, the, the maximum for freshmen is one semester, which would be second semester, and then first semester, for sophomore, and then we say no semester for a junior either. Option one has no to juniors. Option two has juniors included, and uh, could attend either semester their eleventh grade year. And, but both options have no seniors. Correct, no seniors. That's right. So, Except for the transition year. All right. So, is AES able to stay financially viable with just? option one or with no juniors or seniors no, we don't know that option two i would think would be yeah.
Right. Option two is, is probably a little bit more of a safety net, allowing 11th grade students in case, the, in case they had a low uh, interest for a ninth grade year or some of the 10th grade, uh, 10th graders did not want to come back their 10th grade or ninth graders didn't want to come back their 10th grade year. Adding that 11th grade year gives you a little more flexibility to keep those numbers up. So if we had a, a really involved student in, in the sciences, in environmental science though, we're basically not allowing them to go their senior year. So even if, would there be any way that they could still do a, a semester of senior year, or is that going to bind the academy, bind the, the academy as far as the schedule and what they have to offer? That, that day, with everyone on the committee, and, and I know there's extenuating circumstances with the AES lead teacher, everyone there, including that person, uh, did not feel that seniors should attend AES. But I think though, whether it's seniors or not seniors or, or that. What I'm hearing, though, over and over, is a set curriculum and a set schedule. So I think it's I think you either then have to have this thing of either you if you are doing seniors, you've got to have then a program and curriculum that that is for them, not something we kind of and this would respect, but not something we just kind of make up for one to accommodate one kid. <laughs> and and I say that with all of our academies, um, we've got kids that finish their CNAs in their junior year. And they may be still very heavily medical, but there's not a whole lot maybe for them their senior year because they've they've kind of maxed out. So I, I think that to me I can I can certainly agree with the senior, you know, with the recommendation of not having a senior year. I'd be open if they wanted to have a senior year, but I think you need to have them a curriculum that's set and determined, and it's not you know I think that goes back to the overall thing. There should be a consistency in what courses are offered and, and that it, you know from what your program is from day one through um, with what's going to be offered. So to me, I think that's that's where we get into the accommodating, mm -hmm. is where we start going down that slippery slope. Um, we yeah. do want to accommodate all kids, but for example, there is dual enrollment options if someone wants, you know, things. There is virtual dual enrollment options for, you know, starting to get into collegiate you know, uh, marine forces and other things of that nature. And there, and students could be steered in that direction to look at those options. And I don't know if any of our school representatives want to comment on senior, there's the senior year recommendation, you're welcome to come share your thoughts on that. That would be great. I, don't all run forward. Okay. <laughs> personally, I just prefer as a guidance counselor to have more access to my seniors. Um, tracking them for our bright futures is really difficult when they're not there. Just maintaining um, communication with them. It's, it's very difficult when they're not on your campus and there's just so much going on this senior year. So much. I would prefer that they were on our campus. And I have to, as a having a senior, and, and I happen to, my, having the last name of K, it falls under Miss Mason's, um, and I, all the good things we thought about you guys as guidance counselors, I still can't get over until we have a senior year how much you guys do for the students, for the parents, the families, scholarship applications, running off those uh, those uh, tra those uh, transcripts, and and all of the bird dogging you're doing, and that's with kids that are on track. And I know the kids that aren't on track, you guys are doing a whole lot more. Um, they're in therapy in Dr. Connor's office, and uh, um, we, we don't send them to Mr. Kuhn if we can avoid it, unless it's a tech issue. <laughs> um, but we, but truly, we, we appreciate that because there is so much that goes on that senior year. We love you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, so we're going to work on this on the progression plan because I understand the contract is going to be more of a general. Uh, I think what we, we would ask is in the future that we put in the contract that we would that they'll agree to adhere to the pupil progression plan. I think what's happened in the past is you have a contract that says one thing and a pupil progression plan that says something else, and as one gets updated, the other doesn't. You can, I don't think you need to say the same thing in two different documents. So we would we would ask that academics be the curriculum be addressed in the pupil progression plan. And that will be stated in the contract that academics will be addressed in the people progression plan and they'll comply with that. Uh, and the, the contract will be more along the business lines of the charter. Personnel issues, uh, financial issues, and those kind of things that we, we 
more gathered. And the pupil progression plan is something that we review annually. And as needs rise, we can always change that. Absolutely. Way. So it's something that if we come back to you and say this isn't working, they can't keep their numbers up, then we would look at another option. And it's required in statute for us to update the pupil progression plan annually. So, so that must be updated for us on an annual basis. And I mean, you know, I know I want to see AES thrive, and I, you know, in some ways, I, I, I sometimes mm -hmm. think that I don't want to tie their hands where they can't get students. So if there were to be a problem, I guess we could look at that Maybe in the next it. progression plan. Yeah. That's why we're suggesting transitioning into this the first year so that we don't create a situation where they don't have students. Right. And we can have some flexibility in that first year and that we can get a good feel for how that's going <coughs> in the second year and work with them. And I do think having a standard curriculum that those students are taking is going to be uh, important part of solving any issues that they might have. And my, my intent in this is too is, is once I get a little more um, direction from the board, but something like this that is subject to change, you know, we need to make it where it's based upon something that's outside of the contract, which would, like in this case, would be a student progression plan. Just agree, you know, in the contract that the academy is going to follow the student progression plan that's done by by the school board. Because although this contract that we're that's coming um, is going to terminate at the end of June it was a ten-year contract, I'm also my recommendation is not to do another ten-year contract, but do something that's a whole lot shorter, somewhere in the three to five-year range, because the charter school laws keep changing. So I also don't want to get, get put the board into the position like, okay, we're going to you know contract out ten years and then you know and someone can just sit down and say I'm not changing anything, we're modifying anything stuck in a contract for that long and I think that any more of the, the contracts that um, for charter schools are, are much much shorter than what we what we originally done. But like those types of things like uh, you know at least right now you know human resources is you know there are teachers so you know, we're going to tighten up a lot of that and a lot of it's gonna be based upon um, you know just our policies you know and the board's policies and procedures which all can change and, um, there's a, a recommendation here of a district school district committee having to do with course approval. Was that something that would be in the contract? Because that doesn't really part of I think pupil progression plan. I would make that part of the contract if they have to you know, any course that, that the academy board would want to you know have taught there uh, would be subject to going through our uh, course approval process. I, I think for me one of the biggest things is transition here. We, and what I mean by that is we need to do to help AES have those students so that they can be successful in the subsequent years. And the way to do that is obviously is to work together on that transition year. And I'm pleased that staff has recognized that, staff meeting, for those who don't know, staff meeting the district for us, is, is looks towards saying that even with our recommendations, we realize there needs to be some flexibility in working together in that transition year. Because, as Mr. Dodd pointed out, we've got social studies that's out there. That's going to need to be transitioned, but some of those students are going to need to be accommodated and, and taught those courses in transition year. So there's going to need to be coordination, I think, between the district and the academy on you know, how that's going to look and what's going to happen with that. The other thing, too, is there may be, and on both sides, there may be more students that are interested in going to the academy knowing Oh, okay, so I'm going to be there only half the time, and I may have a good tie to my base school. I think potentially there could be much more students going there because you're actually setting a whole new group of students every semester there. Um, and just running some numbers, to me, there it was actually a, a higher enrollment over the long term of, of how many students then get access to that school. Because conceivably, you're doubling the amount of students that would have access to that school or nearly double that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Um, so we if we work this out of the progression plan 
and the contract's going to be more on the business end. I know it was discussed that we have uh, a look at a joint meeting of boards, but is there really a need for that if you're going to work out the the student progression plan? What's the what's the plan? Well, there will be other issues. Let me let me back up. It sounds to me like the board. You know, one of the questions I was going to ask today is, what is the board's intent? Okay, because you know you have a 90-day deadline. You say you're going to renew it, you're going to not renew it, or you're going to probably terminate it or whatever. It doesn't sound like you're going to start the day. Terminate it. But you know another option is for you know, the, the, the way that the, the district or school is is basically like one of our schools that's run by another board. So it's almost like they're managing the school and not but all the all the issues that happen out there fall back here on to the school board. So other options are, you know, when I was thinking about this, if they want to be a true charter, which means that they have to apply to go through the charter school and they run it, you know, they get the FTE and everything else, they run it on their own and then we, you know, they hire their teachers, you know, they get their own students, they do all that, and we step out of it and they run it however however they want. The student actually graduates. I don't know if that's something that they're going to be able to undertake and then, and then have enough to, to, go, to go through with that. Um, but so if, if we're not heading down that route, then there's going to be other issues that are going to be discussed is how we're going to handle HR matters, you know, which currently we handle all the HR matters. We discipline, you know, um, we discipline the students, we discipline the, the, the teachers, our instructional staff, and all of those fall on to us. There's going to be my opinion, there needs to be more um, responsibility placed on the AES board on some of that. There, there needs to be some financial responsibility placed on the AES board for some of this, depending on what the circumstances are. I know there's just a litany of things, so um, I'd be more than happy to, to have private discussions with their attorney and go through that route. Or, you know, I, I know what you're saying, but we need a board to sit down like that. Well, one of the things I think is, is if this board, if our board today says, listen, we're we could work with either one of these two options, um, and we, you know, go for, you know, go forth and, and, you know, let's see where we, we can work those through because there's transition issues to talk about. There's some other ones. Um, that's not to say that's just our board saying that. So our board can say that. The AES board can meet and say we don't want any part of everything you've just said. And where does that leave us? No, I mean, that, I'm asking that question. Where did that leave us legally then? Because our, if we send a letter of intent, our letter of intent is based on, for the moment, this conversation it's today. Be based us, it's going to be based upon, you know, obviously, you know, uh, coming into an agreement on the contract. The contract obviously has to be the contracts that are terminated at the end of the day. So, you know, we need to present a letter saying we would like to agree with some of these terms and conditions and they would say yes or no. And at that point, if the answer is that, that they say no or that there is not a meeting of the minds that take place, what happens? I think, though, that this group of our administrators, our counselors, and, and the AES board have done, and I, I think it sounds like this moment was quite part of the deal. I, I compliment you on the work that you brought us today. Um, I think it's clear. I think it's in the best interest of the kids. Um, and I don't have any problem with either one of the options either. Um, so I, I think you working with the AES attorney and coming up with a contract, and then I don't think we need to be involved until you bring us the contract and, and people progression language, and that's it. I, I think you guys have done a tremendous job setting some of this out. Yeah, that's fine. And the, the, the notifications need to go out by the end of March. So, um, there, there is, I think, though, an issue that the AES, because I know I've already seen on Facebook everybody's asking whether they've gotten acceptance letters to all the different academies and so forth. Um, I think, though, the one direction is, is hopefully what we'll end up consensus, you know, giving consensus here, allows you to sit down with AES and hammer out a transition plan so that they can make a decision about getting those notices out. The fact is they don't, there, there isn't even an administrator there right now, so I'll be 
Yes. Will is personal. But is the conversation we're going though right now, would that allow you all to be able to then move yeah, forward with the yeah, transition? We, yes. We know that the board is going to support option two with a transition year and give us some flexibility that we can go ahead and move forward with AES and allow them to start sending out acceptance letters to ninth graders and, and uh, they, they can start moving forward with that process. And all our academies had a deadline of uh, actually the end of this month with February uh, to send out acceptance okay. letters. So we're all operating under the same timeline. That's, that's but I don't know that AES has been able right. to release yeah. those yet. Yeah. Because they don't, they, they're still, I think, wait, they were waiting for today's meeting to see what direction. Right. So I think the hope is is that there'll be enough and information. Just giving them the flexibility for freshmen, because that was the big hold up. So we got to tell freshmen they can't come till January, then they weren't going to have enough students to open the doors in August. But if we're going to give them that flexibility the first year and the transition year, which we recommend doing, then I think they'll be okay to be able to move forward. But again, back to Mr. Bradshaw, and I, I don't foresee this happening. But Mr. Bradshaw and uh, their attorney work out a contract, and you, you or the AES board are not agreeable to it, and that falls through. That we would falls back on the schools. Then they'll have to reschedule those freshmen in another way. I don't foresee that happening, but I just want to make sure you're aware of that. It, it, you know, and that's really what my question was: to make sure that we all realize so it's still. And I can't, if we've come this far, I can't see that. I don't either, but and again, I, with, back to Mr. Dodd's original question, I don't know what uh, all of you sitting in one meeting would accomplish that the two attorneys aren't going to accomplish getting input from their boards mm -hmm. and input from their staffs and moving forward. And the answer to the question is what happens if we can't come to an agreement? You know, that's right. the answer to the question. Okay. Right. So. I think, I don't know, I have confidence in. Mr. Roland and the board to do whatever they need to do to get the paperwork going. Yeah, and so I, I don't think we even need a motion. I'm not sure. Uh, no, we, we, I think we have what we need, we have what we need to have, forward. and we'll move forward and get, you know, rest assured. Our goal is to work with them to keep AES thriving and not looking for ways to, to make it difficult for the students. We, want them to get, we just want to get back to the mission of AES uh, and what they were found it to do and support them to do that. So we'll, we'll move forward with the option two, which included 11th grade students. It'll include this uh, transition plan, but it'll also include that ninth graders can attend first or second semester and allowing that flexibility during this transition year. And I don't think we have, because they, they don't have, they don't fall under um, classroom size other than by a school average. So they have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. And then also if they're electives, they have a lot of flexibility. So what I mean by that is the numbers has to do with really, you know, you all, uh, between you and, and them working out the numbers. We don't, it has, it's irrelevant to us. I they know what that. they need enrollment wise to, in order to, to make their payroll. So they know what that magic number is that they would have. And we'll have a little bit of, they may be able to take more freshmen than they realize. And I mean, ultimately, of that 120, if, if they would have only taken 50 or 60, maybe they can take more than that by splitting it up to two semesters. Correct. And then all those ninth graders, when they go into 10th grade, they would all go during that first semester. Right. And that's what I was thinking. Why, in some ways, there is a there is a silver lining out of this, and that is that you're going to double up in the year you need to be doubling up. Just tough to get something like this started if you don't get the flexibility. That's true. Absolutely. In that first year, we'll have a little bit of flexibility also with the course offerings as well during this transition year. But the next year, we're going to get, try to get to those course outlines that we've established and the, the guidelines we've established. Thank you very much, Mr. Roll. Right, thank you, Mr. Roll. Excellent job. We're going to take a five minute break. Mm -hmm. Welcome. <laughs>